Hi guys, today's case should be a very simple one. It should be a young woman was killed and the perpetrator was brought to justice and is in prison. But sadly and frustratingly, there's just so much more to it. This is the murder of Rachel Kiley. Rachel Kiley was from Inishmore Square in Ballincollig, County Cork. She lived with her parents, John and Rose, her brother Jason and her sisters, Rosalind and Elizabeth. The family were members of, and interestingly enough, there was at the time, anyway, when our story takes place in 2000, like 5,000 in all of Ireland. And in Ballincollig, there was 40. Rachel's family already took up five. So it was, as you can imagine, a very close, tight community. Rachel was described as reserved and reliable. She was very devoted to her fate. She regularly attended meetings. And when she finished school, she actually decided to train as a beautician because she felt that this type of career would allow her to focus more on her fate. When our story takes place, Rachel is 22. And living around the corner from her is 16 year old Ian Horgan. He lives with his parents and his three younger siblings. He actually went to school with Rachel's brother and it would come out later then that he had left school at 14. Now this is, it is said that, like he would later say that he was like kicked out. His dad would try and make it be like, no, we were just told it would be best if he was to leave. Like if a school is telling you to like leave at 14, it's best for you to leave. That's, you're, you're being kicked out. No child should be leaving school at 14. So I don't really even know why another school wasn't looked into. But anyway, we can talk about that later. So at this time, when our story takes place, he is working as a crate assembler for a local packaging company. Horgan was actually a promising athlete. He played GAA and had won like all Ireland medals. He was also going out with a girl called Sharon uh, for two years at this point. Now I'll put up some maps. So close to the estate that uh, Rachel and Ian lived in was Regional Park and it's quite close and it's quite big. On Thursday the 26th of October 2000, Rachel was spending time in her room reading the book of Daniel and studying some Italian. She had actually only recently come back from a trip to Italy and as she does around 5 p.m she went for a walk in Regional Park with the family's two dogs. Her mother would say that this usually took kind of like 30 minutes and then she'd be back. She actually was due to attend a Bible study class or group later that evening. At 5.40 p.m. the dogs came back alone and were scratching at the door. I'm going to read a quote from Rachel's mother Rose. It wasn't normal for the dogs to come back out without Rachel. It was getting late so it began to get anxious. We walked through the gap in the fence and I remember seeing children playing on the field to my right. At that point Elizabeth said she heard a scream or cry coming from straight ahead and it sounded like it was low to the ground. The ruins of the old house were up to my left. I called Rachel's name two or three times but got no reply. We walked ahead past the old house and over the little bridge. It began to get dark so we decided to go back. We then met Ian Horgan coming towards us away from the ruins. I said hi and he said hi back. I never saw Rachel with Ian before but they would have known each other. It is also said in some sources that when she said hi, he just kind of like saluted her. A search party was quickly formed and this included Rachel's family, friends, Gardaí and members of their church. And then at around 8 p.m. Rachel's body was found entangled in the ferns and briars behind an old house called the Watch House and her baseball cap would be found at the entrance to this house. So it is believed that this is obviously where she had been grabbed or there could have been a struggle here. So I did try to get a picture of the ruins and I think this is it. So I'll put it up now. Um, I am open to being corrected if I got the wrong image. Up to 50 Gardaí were involved in the investigation into Rachel's murder. They carried out nearly a thousand door-to-door -door inquiries. There was a crime line or crime call appeal. They were focusing on like the four hours before she had been found. So like that just kind of before she went for the walk, when she went for the walk and then when her mother and sister had been looking for her. They were looking at the theory that maybe she could have been, you know, stalked for a while and then attacked by someone or that it could have been someone she knew. Uh, the Gardaí carried out a reconstruction of, you know, her regular journey 
in the park. There was a fingertip search carried out as well. So that's when they like go by a little, little you know, real close uh, examining the ground and stuff. A family friend and one of the um, Jehovah's Witnesses elders, Javin or Javin Andrews said, he just spoke for the family basically and said, at present they are in a state of shock. You just never think that it's going to happen to someone you know. She was such a nice, kind young girl, a gentle nature. It's just such an unbelievable thing to happen. Talking about Rachel's life has been very painful and upsetting. On the 30th of October, Rachel's funeral was held in the Kingdom Hall on Hibernian Road near Anglesey Street. She was laid to rest in St. Oliver's Cemetery. And her uncle actually came over to, um, I don't know what you say for a funeral, like officiate, officiate the, the funeral. Um, he was actually obviously like a, an elder or whatever in the church and he lived in the UK. And so Dr. Max Walden described Rachel as a beautiful girl in both nature and appearance. He asked mourners not to dwell on vengeance. We question all the time over and over again why this had, ha had to happen to Rachel. Someone so good, respectful and beautiful. But we must remember that she is with Jehovah. Now, one source mentions that Horgan attended the funeral in Horgan. Now I I only saw it in one source and couldn't see it and couldn't find it anywhere else. However, that wouldn't be unusual because like that they were neighbours. He lives just around the corner and they knew the families knew each other. So the guardy obviously spoke to people who had been in the park at this time and they would obviously then say if they saw other people. And so blood samples were actually taken from about six men who had been noted to be in the park or the area at the time. One of these was Ian Horgan. In fact, his old babysitter, Neve Cotter, would say that he had been in the park around that time. And two days after Rachel's murder, the door-to-door -door inquiries landed on his door. So he lied about his movements that night. And as soon as the guardie left, he packed a bag and fled. However, around midnight, Gardy picked him up and because he was a minor, they took him home. Horgan would deny knowing Rachel. He said like that, that he went to school with her brother, that he knew her to kind of salute. He keeps saying everything that he salutes people. Um, and at the last time he would have seen her was in the September at like the local Debs. For anyone outside of Ireland, the Debs is like your prom basically. So it wouldn't have been that they were going or anything. Obviously, um, I know like where I'm from, people will come down, there's like an area that picks everybody up and stuff like that. So it could have been that everybody was being picked up at like the local church. And so he just happened, to, that's what he's saying anyway, that he just happened to see her there. On Sunday, Dr. Maureen Smith found semen present in the swabs that had been taken from Rachel. Horgan was asked for a blood sample. And of course he was afraid of needles. So the guardian were like, that's fine. Saliva and hair will do. So he had no reason to say no now. And he gave them. These samples were then obviously delivered by the Gardaí to the Forensic Science Ireland Laboratory. These matched the samples taken from Rachel. And on November 10th, Ian Horgan was arrested and charged with the rape and murder of Rachel Kylie. And listen to this, this is how like good her family are. When her dad, John, heard that that's who had been arrested, he like felt sympathy for Horgan's parents and went around to their house to like express sympathy and like his condolences that this has happened kind of thing. But obviously they went there, they had gone to the police station with their um, son. This was the first murder to hit or affect the um, members of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Ireland. And so it completely shocked everybody. And even just the area, you know, with this nice little local area and they, they were just shocked into silence is what's described. The trial would come to court in May 2002. Rachel's brother couldn't attend the court due to the anger he felt. Rachel's father had given evidence, but then later on in the, in the trial couldn't attend because he had had surgery. I'm not sure for what or, or anything, but he obviously had to recover and so he couldn't attend. The trial actually lasted 26 days over seven weeks. Ian Horgan himself would testify, as would his girlfriend, and at least his father. And it would actually be said that um, the prosecution would accuse them of like committing perjury to obviously protect their son. And I understand that, obviously everybody can understand that in a way, but obviously still it's like, you know, your son is a sociopath. 
The psychologist, Dr. John Harbison, would say that Rachel had been manually strangled and that there was more than one compression mark meaning that it wasn't just kind of once, it was over and over again, and that this was ample evidence of violence with the intention to kill. He believed that Rachel ran from the front around to the back of the um, old ruins to try to get away. There was extensive bruising on one side of her jaw, and she had obviously done other like wounds and bruises, like superficial cuts and stuff like this. So it was actually believed that possibly it was an arm lock, and so the choking is actually said to have precipitated a cardiac, a cardiac arrest and that that's what she died from then. Dr. Morian Smith and Dr. Helen Ramsbottom gave evidence about fibres that were found. So green, blue and brown acrylic fibres on Rachel's grey fleece matched to Horgan's jumper. And then there was four red acrylic fibres that matched a red arsenal hat that Horgan left near his motorbike. So the defence would basically call Dr. Denise Syndicombe Court and she was a recognised like DNA expert over in the UK, in London. And she would say that the swabs and stuff that were taken from Rachel were corked but not sealed. And so that even though it was very unlikely it was theoretically possible that there was contamination. The prosecution would say that this was just a red herring and that it was the sample from Horgan that matched and that he was the only one to give a saliva sample out of all the men who gave one. The prosecution would say that the site where Rachel's body was found in a hollow surrounded by ferns and briars behind, behind an old ruin in Alakalik Regional Park was not somewhere any sane person would go by consent on a rainy night. The scene, coupled with other evidence and the conclusion from the state pathologist that Rachel tried to escape her attacker, indicated an attempted flight after prior sexual activity where there was no question of consent in any way. Horgan claims that he was out with his friends earlier in the day, but that he then left them to go home, eat his dinner and then return to the park. After murdering Rachel, Ian Horgan then rejoined his friends at half six in one of their houses and watched telly. They went back to the park a while later and they saw like all the lights, you know, from people look out looking for Rachel and they scattered. At the time, Horgan got his friends to basically say that they didn't know anything about his bike. But once they realised that he was like involved in this, they, that whole thing, that fake alibi collapsed. Either way, he puts himself there at 5.20 p.m. I'm just going to put in the testimony of Sharon Wright, purely because, I'll be honest, I don't really understand what it has to do with anything. I don't know if they're trying to say that he was trying to scare her or something. I'm not really sure. So I'm just going to read it. So the Saturday before Rachel's murder, she says that they had an argument in the park. She ran away down an embankment. He came down and grabbed me. He said, there's somebody watching you. And I said, where? And he said, over on the left hand side there in the corner. I had heard noises before, like twigs breaking. I was frightened. Sharon ran, ran from the park. Horgan would give almost the same story, except he said there was no argument. He says that Sharon was startled by something she saw in the bushes, so that instead of going to the old room, the two of them just sat at the rocks at the entrance to the park, hung around talking. Horgan would claim that the reason that he had, you know, ran off after the guardy came to the door was because his motorbike had no tax or insurance on it. And apparently a guard had called to the house like a week before that and gave him like a form. And it said that he'd been seen driving through a red traffic light. So obviously with dangerous driving and then no tax, no insurance, these were all listed on the green form. So he was told or thought that, you know, he was in serious trouble for this. And essentially that is why he liked it. When the judge, you know, at the end, he kind of instructs or directs the jury. There was a jury of five women and seven men. And he basically, like, obviously said loads of stuff, but then said, if you believe the DNA, he did it. So the jury deliberated and hadn't reached um, a decision. And so the judge then instructed them that he would accept a majority verdict. Now, I actually feel like four hours isn't a lot. I feel like in other cases, it's been a bit longer than that before it comes to that point. But anyway, he said he would take a majority verdict. And after only another half an hour, 
they reached a majority verdict of 10 to 2 to find Ian Horgan guilty of murder and rape. He received the mandatory sentence of life for murdering Rachel and then 10 years for the rape. Now these are served concurrently. And they said that they were going to appeal on the grounds of the DNA and the fact that the judge had said what he said. And on the 6th of December 2004, those convictions were quashed. He was granted bail on the 31st of January 2005 and a new trial would begin on the 21st of February 2006. And at this one, he would plead not guilty to the murder, but guilty to manslaughter. Before this trial went ahead, on the 7th of December 2005, so literally just a, a year after the convictions for the other one was quashed, and not even a full year since he has been re released, he would be up in McCroom District Court for assault, where he would receive 30 days. So at the second trial, at this point, John Harbison is no longer um, working, like, or, or practicing in his field. So the new state pathologist, Marie Cassidy, Dr. Marie Cassidy, would give evidence based on the photos that were taken, obviously, from the, this, the crime scene and the post-mortem and stuff. She basically agreed with everything that uh, Dr. Harbison had said. She said about the arm lock, that, there would, that this would have led to the cardiac arrest, everything like this. Basically, a new witness came forward and this was a neighbour of Horgan's, Mrs. McCoy. And she would basically say that at around half eight, she had, on the night of the murder, she had seen a ambulance in the park. And between that time and quarter to nine, she saw Horgan and said like, oh, did he know what had happened? And that he said that Miss Kylie had been beaten. Now, when the defense asked uh, Brennan Gwen, Brennan Gwen, whether she was aware that another witness, Anthony McCulloch, had said the same thing in a local shop, she replied, no, not at the time. Now, she didn't give this statement to Gardy until November 13th, 2000. And he said, I take it from that, it didn't strike you as particularly odd or sinister what was said at the time. Otherwise, you would have brought it to the attention of Gardy. At the time, we were just in complete shock. So, Justice Barry White, who I always liked because I think just because his name reminded me of the singer, he, like, they, they basically found him guilty. Obviously, he pled guilty to the manslaughter, so that's why he was found, like, found guilty for them, or whatever. And so this is what he was being sentenced for. And so, Justice Barry White sentenced him to eight years with six suspended. And the reasoning for this was, he had spent about four and a bit, four and a half years already in prison. And if you were to receive a six year sentence with like the remission, so basically all our sentences automatically get a quarter off. So for every year, you really only do nine months. And this would have basically, and then obviously good behavior and stuff. So this would have brought a six year sentence down to around four and a half. So he was basically saying he has already served six years of the sentence. And so he really only had two left to do. And then again, because of the like remission and good behavior and stuff for that one, he would be out in less than two years. He also said that at the time of this crime, he had no other previous convictions. Even though after he was released, he went on to assault someone and be convicted for that. He was saying that at the time he murdered Rachel or killed, admitted manslaughter to Rachel, he had no other convictions. And so they, like he was taking that into account. He was also taking into account that the fact that he pled guilty to the, to the manslaughter and stuff like that. It's just madness. And Rachel's family would basically say it was an insult to her memory. However, Justice Barry White did say that, like he essentially alluded it to Horgan being lucky that Harrison wasn't there to, you know, give his own evidence because Marie Cassidy obviously couldn't give as like severe of a testimony. Rachel's sister Elizabeth would say, Rachel's gone and all our lives have been destroyed. He'll be walking free in 18 months and there's nothing we can do to give Rachel back her life. It's disgusting. I am 22 now, which is the same age as Rachel when she died, and I feel so angry. It's been horrendous going through a second trial and we have had no justice at all. They believe that the legal system favours the perpetrator, not the victim. 
Who is going to feel safe when he is out walking free in 18 months? The only good thing that will come out of this is that he will be on the sex offenders register. When Horgan was arrested, he couldn't be named um, because he was still under 18. But by the time the trial came to court, he was then 18, so he was allowed to be named. So he was, and his photograph and everything was there. He had spent that time in Pat, St. Pat's, and then I don't know, I'm not sure if he went to Mount Joy then once he turned 18. There was another appeal in 2007, but this time it was by the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions. And they managed to get the eight year sentence increased to 12. Now, as I said at the start of the video, that should really be it. I mean, I give out all the time that life doesn't mean life. And even then, if he's getting 12 years, he'll be out really after nine years, this type of thing, right? Nine, 10. But that's not even the worst of it. You know, I've, I've spoken about people who have, you know, killed their wives and, you know, done whatever else and then, or like killed, killed kids I've talked about and then they've got off or they've done whatever and that's it. They've kind of just gone from public life. No. Ian Horgan, who was described as a great footballer and a good kid and all this stuff, right, and that he came from a good home, just got worse. And we do know that like that when young young offenders go into prison and are exposed to drugs and all this sort of stuff, that that can obviously cause issues. They will get addictions and then they just go out and have to commit more crimes because this and that. But I don't think that's right in this case because Ian didn't start with a small assault or a robbery or whatever other minor thing so to speak he was put into prison for and then like that all got into the wrong crowd and then he became addicted to heroin and all and then went out and done whatever his first crime was the rape and murder of a young woman nothing else can be blamed after that I'm basically just going to go on now and tell you the rest of Ian Horgan's life up until now. In 2007, Ian Horgan pled not guilty to another trial. This was for the robbery of a post office. However, the post office was connected to the house of like the proprietors or whatever. And they were an elderly couple. And so he terrorised them. He tied them up in their kitchen and robbed I, uh, it's over a thousand anyway in like cash and stuff and then he wrote those scratch cards and stuff like that and just as you know this was all happening the couple's son arrived so obviously then he took the, him tied him up and everything and then stole his car he had used a slash hook and a kitchen knife to terrorize the elderly couple he gave his girlfriend at the time I don't know who his girlfriend is at this time I don't know if it's Sharon um, I would like to think she had more sense than that. But he gave his girlfriend at the time 950 euro. And when she obviously asked, like, where did this come from? He said the credit union. If you don't know what the credit union is, it's like a friendlier bank. Now, like he's done before, he was found guilty. He appealed. And then when the new trial came, he pled not guilty to like, or he pled guilty to like a, a lower charge. And that seems to be like his MO. And so he was sentenced to four years, but the four years had to start after he served the sentence for Rachel's murder. Both the defence and the judge would talk about redemption. And that's what I'm saying, like, he already started off so bad. We're not talking about someone who had just done this, like, minor kind of crime and that they had the possibility, like, the idea of suspended sentences and stuff like that, and I don't like them, right? Or like that, the fact that they take some of your sentence off for good behaviour and stuff. The idea is then that the person will want to, it's supposed to incentivise them to behave in, in, in prison. But then also to want to kind of be rehabilitated and all this jazz. But there are some people that that's not possible for. And I think someone who is capable of rape and murder at 16 just isn't. Sometimes when, this, when I'm talking about stuff, I try to think of someone I know of that age. I'm like, God, that's like, you know, whoever. And I didn't really realize it. I said to my sister about this, that this was the case I was gonna do. And when I said 16, she was like, that's like, that's her son's age. My nephew is 16. And I'm like, he, like, he's a kid. No sane, normal child, teenager is thinking like that. 
In March 2013, he violently assaulted another inmate in Wheatfield Prison. And this was Jer Dundon. Now, Jer Dundon, I don't really, I'm not, I'm not really big into the gangland stuff, so you just can look it up if you want. But basically, he's a member of the Dundon McCarthy or the McCarthy Dundon gang in Limerick. And like, he's, you know, and yeah, Ian Horgan bit him up, bit him up, beat him up so badly that he had to be hospitalised. Ian Horgan was then transferred out, obviously partly as punishment, but again, also for his own protection because he had, you know, beat someone who was connected or whatever. But November of that year, 2013, that was it, he was released then. So this was him serving his sentence for Rachel and for the elderly couple at the post office. Now, when he left prison, he was greeted by his girlfriend. Hugs and kisses and all this, okay? And they went back to Limerick, which is where she lived, and he moved in with her and he gave his address, his permanent address, as her address in Limerick. And her name is Theresa O'Neill. And you might be thinking like me, gosh, like what type of woman would go out with a man who has raped and murdered but I'm here to tell you that I don't know if Teresa's standards would be up to what yours and mine might be. Uh, I just want to say quickly, sorry, obviously the lighting has now changed because I had to take a break from recording and the the it's not as bright out now. And also my hair was wrecking my head, so I just had to, I'll put it all to one side. That's what I get for trying something new. So yeah, sorry, straight back into the story. So Teresa O'Neill's brother was Thomas and Thomas O'Neill was one of the Cratlow Wood rapists. So basically on the 24th of January 2004 a couple were in their car in Cratlow Woods which is in Clare so it's close to Limerick and it was late like it was like 3am or something and this group of teenagers came across them. So there was teenagers Thomas O'Neill Dean Barry, who were all 16. And then a 15 year old called Jason Ring. And then there was one man in their 20s with him. And basically they came across the couple in their car. And basically they used, they had like, uh, I think golf, a golf club and other weapons and stuff. And they beat the man and locked him in the boot of his car. And then the five of them proceeded to rape, take turns raping the woman while her boyfriend could hear. From what I read, I think he somehow then managed to get out of the boot and I think grabbed one of the golf clubs or got something else out of the car and was able to kind of, I think, fight them off. And then they obviously called for help. So as I said, there was three 16 year olds. There was a man in his twenties and there was a 15 year old. At their trial, Thomas O'Neill was said to be their leader of that gang. He was 16 and he led that gang rape. So back to Ian Horgan. In fairness to the Gardaí, they were keeping an eye on him and within days they were like they were stopping him, you know, in his car or in whoever's car. And it turned out that he was keeping company with Joseph Finnerty, who was it says child sex attacker, but basically that's just a paedophile or a child rapist. So I, I don't understand why we try to make things sound less when it comes to kids because I feel like it loses the impact. So anyway, he was seen with this man, like cut out with him or whatever, three times. So he's obviously not even trying to keep good company. And if you want to talk about keeping good company, Horgan was Thomas O'Neill's best man at his wedding. Two peas in a pod. Again, still in the same month, November, Ian Horgan decided to jump over a counter in um, Sean's shop in Limerick and like try to grab from the count, from the tail and stuff. And the manager managed, he had a scarf on, managed to grab at the scarf. And then so Ian Hor Horgan headed off and he got like 60 euro or something. His DNA was then obviously in the system or whatever. So he was, it was matched to the scarf. Now he would try to say that it was an opportunistic robbery because the till was open and he just decided to do it. Right, wearing a scarf up on his face, I'm pretty sure I read that he had gloves, like rubber gloves or something on. I'm just wearing my rubber gloves out. This is pre-COVID. He was refused bail. He pled guilty and got five years, but one suspended. 
So guys, like I'm literally just gonna go through the next 10 years essentially of what Ian Horgan was up to. So in January 2015, Ian Horgan, who is 30 at this time, was charged with like shooting at a guy. It wasn't, I don't think it was, it was with pellets or something, but like shot like they shoot loads or something. So he didn't die, but like was injured or whatever. And so he was charged and brought to trial with this, but uh, the jury found him unanimously not guilty. Ian Hogan would also then go on to commit another knife point robbery in a store and this time he held a knife up to the female staff member's chest. He would be found guilty of this and sentenced to four years. In November 2017, he fled basically because there were assault allegations against him. It is said that he first came to Dublin and was staying in the City West Hotel and then that he left for the UK. Obviously, they would notice nearly straight away because he is a registered sex offender. So obviously, he's supposed to be keeping them up to date with like where he is and stuff. And as I said, Hogan just seems to not be able to stay out of trouble. So after one of the last robbery charges, he was released in December 2016. But by March of 2017, he was already in trouble again. So from what I gather at this, it says a property in McCroom in Cork, which is in Cork. But other sources have mentioned that it was his family home. So perhaps his family moved from uh, Inishmore Square in Bally, um, Bally College, Balling College, sorry. And maybe that's what, you know, he was now staying with them. But anyway, there was a tip off that drugs were being dealt or sold or whatever from the house. So McCroom Gardy arrived with a specially trained sniffer dog and conducted a search of the bedroom where Horgan stayed. A bedside locker that had been covered with clothes and other items attracted the attention of the dog. There was a sock in the drawer and within this there was six plastic wraps of heroin and there was also a Wayne scales in the drawer. The total value of the heroin was three grand. I don't know about heroin so I don't know if that's a lot, if that's a little six wraps I don't know how many how many you're getting in each of them how many portions are in that I don't know when this went to trial Horgan basically you know pled guilty to it and explained that he was being paid in heroin for transporting heroin which he had to do to pay off a drug debt so that's why he said he was doing it and that's why he had the heroin Horgan received a sentence of two years and three months with the last six suspended and Judge Gerard O'Brien described Horgan's previous convictions as somewhat alarming. So on the 1st of March 2021, he is released. It's reported in the newspapers and there's photos of like, Jerry are hugging him and all this. We are now in May of 2022. So on the 4th of May 2022, an arrest warrant had been issued for Ian Horgan because he failed to appear at McCroom District Court. This was for an alleged breach of the Sex Offenders Act 2001. And so when the judge like asked like where like his solicitor, where is he? His solicitor, Sean Cattle, said his client hadn't been in touch. He said he should be here, but he isn't. And when the judge asked if he was likely, like if it was, you know, would he show up later in the day? He said that it was unlikely. And apparently he had already, like, he was supposed to be up in the court in October 2021 for this breach of the act. And an arrest warrant was sent. And he didn't show up for that one either. Like, so an arrest warrant was sent. And then now we're at this one in May and he still hasn't shown up. Anyway, now listen up because this is very important. Not just for our story, but for the safety of all the women in Ireland basically who are dating so what he done to breach sex offenders act he was on tinder and so the guard he believed that this breached it now he was going under the name keen and so obviously it was also the fact then that he was kind of pretending to be someone else or whatever now he would say eventually that this was a typo conveniently he chose a name that only had one letter added to his so that he was able to be like oh no I just I must have pressed C before I and so that was his story now the guardian or the courts or whatever are in the process of requesting the like data and information from tinder but I'm also just going to quote from one of the sources that says 
There are no laws or restrictions stopping registered sex offenders from trawling dating apps such as Bumble and Tinder. The gap in digital legislation has been highlighted following the recent case, the case of killer and rapist Ian Horgan, who was using Tinder under a fake name when he was identified by chance by another user who reported him to Gardaí. Ian Horgan was busy last year, and our next bit of information happens in March of 2022. Sorry, I also just want to point out, I think he's still with Teresa at all this point. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure because his address is still from that area in Limerick. At 2.30pm, March 26, 2022, Ian Horgan knocked at the home of Mary O'Callaghan. When the 66-year-old woman opened the door, he pushed past her with a claw hammer and began to attack her 29-year-old son, Hassan Baker. I'm going to read a quote from Mary. He was swinging a hammer when he came in. I did not know this man. My son, Hassan, rushed to my aid and this man put him in an arm, arm lock and started to pound him. There was blood everywhere. I felt so helpless. It was like being a part of a horror movie, but unfortunately it was real. He kept on pounding Hassan's head with the hammer. At this stage, Hassan was unconscious and I thought he was dead. I managed to get in between them and I shouted that he is dead. I didn't realise at this stage, but he had also broken my right hand with a blow of the hammer. After I said to him that Hassan was dead, he left. I really felt my son Hassan was dead as the place was like a bloodbath. The next thing I remember was being in the hospital and doctors were explaining about the brain surgery that they were going to perform on my son. I wasn't able to take it all in. When I look at the marks on my son's head, I can see the imprint of the hammer on the side of his skull. I know I am lucky he is alive. So I think by this point, Horgan is back living in McCroom. Um, he was anyway, the, he, that's where he was when he'd done this because he went by bus from McCroom to Cork City. There's CCTV that caught him. He was carrying a bag that had the claw hammer and had a change of clothes. So he went to like, you know, like a derelict property or whatever and changed into the clothes that were in his bag and then went to the home. And after all this happened, he left and went back to the derelict property and changed back into his other clothes. And then he sent, because I feel like that quote makes it sound like it was all really quick and in a rush. But it must not have been completely because Horgan took videos. He took videos of, of this, you know, the crime and the scene and Hassan and stuff unconscious and bloody. During this investigation, the guardian took his phone. And they saw that he had sent videos to his girlfriend uh, that he was washing the blood off his knuckles. I destroyed him. He won't be acting the hard man ever again. So from what I gathered is Hassan Baker used to date his girlfriend or had a thing with his girlfriend or whatever. But I don't even know how long ago it was. I don't know if this is still Theresa O'Neill or not. I don't know if the girlfriend was antagonizing Horgan or goading him or whatever or if he just got this into his head and done it himself. Hassan Baker suffered a fracture to his skull, a fractured cheekbone. There was injuries to his eye socket. He had to undergo surgery. After this he struggled with PTSD, speech problems and nightmares. Apparently Horgan spoke with an accent that you know like a strange accent or something and said something about a drug debt when he was there. So even then like if it's supposed to be kind of like, oh, like Hassan was coming after your woman or something, then why are you even bringing up something about a drug debt? Because then you obviously don't want him to know it was you. Fear of retaliation, maybe. And he sent these videos to his girlfriend. And that's so strange, because then like, after texting his girlfriend, he left. He left the country for four months. But like that, when he arrived back, they arrested him. I'm just going to read then the, um, Hassan Baker's statement from the trial. When I fell to the ground, I was then beaten with a hammer using full force to the side of my head by Ian Horgan. He also caught me on the shoulder with the claw of the hammer. I was knocked, I was knocked to the ground with the impact and blood flowed massively from my head. I had tried to protect my mother while I struggled to defend myself, but I was helpless. Since I was assaulted, I have felt devastated, scared, and I live in a paranoid state, looking out the window and over my shoulder every single day. I am always on alert in case something sudden happens. I have constant nightmares and night terrors. I scream. I wake screaming in the night. I have a huge scar on my head after the surgery and a significant mark on my face. This is a constant reminder to me of what happened that day. My speech has been affected majorly and I have to see an occupational therapist. 
I feel embarrassed talking to people. I still continue to I still continue to see doctors and I am due to go for another brain scan soon to determine the full extent of the damage done. He has short term memory. He's had three seizures and he suffers with migraines. I feel bad for my mother. This all happened in her home. I never even spoke to Ian Horgan before this and yet he came to our house with the intention of causing serious harm to me. I don't ever want to see him again. I would like to ensure he stays away from our home in future. Horgan's defence solicitor, Jim O'Mahony, uh, said that Horgan wrote letters of apology to the two of them and that his client was addicted to heroin and crack cocaine. So just recently enough, on the 20th of June this year, he was found guilty of the assault. Sorry, he pled guilty to the assault and he was sentenced to eight and a half years. So, okay, and he's probably going to be on like six. So that's him up to now. I just think it's wild that you could say that someone like 23 years ago committed a rape and murder. And we're not even talking about, oh, now look what he done 23 years later. He, he was free to do stuff for so long in between. And it is just crazy. Like as I said, it's sad, but it's just frustrating. Rachel's family, I read, moved out of the area. I know this probably means F all to her family, really. But if there's any type of teen little bit of solace or, or comfort that they could take from it, Rachel's case actually helped to solve another unsolved rape. So basically, when they were taking the samples from the different men in the area or who had been seen in the park and stuff, these samples were obviously tested and they're kind of just, I think, tested against everything as well, not just um, that specific swab. And the results came back for one of the men, Connor Downey. He was eliminated as a suspect in Rachel Kylie's case, but his DNA was linked back to a serious sexual assault in Cork in the 1980s. Downey actually served a sentence already in the UK for the murder of another Irish woman, um, Suzanne Redden from Donegal, so for, her, for the manslaughter of her in 1988, which was the same time that this rape of a nurse happened, also in 1988. And then last year, though he died, he the house he lived in in Cork then, it was said like he was kind of just like a hair merchant. Yeah, the house basically went on fire. Oh, I think they could have said like that. He must have been smoking or something. So yeah, I just feel like there was a lot of kind of different connections and links and stuff in this case. Like that, uh, the fact that like he ends up going out with the sister of another rapist who also raped at 16. And then the fact that Rachel's investigation helped to lead and capture another scumbag. So yeah, that's that's the case of Rachel Kylie's murder, story of Ian Horgan. Um, I hope I didn't forget everything, anything because like, as I said, there's a lot of all these bits involving him. Yeah, apologies for not posting in about five years. I had said that my uh, baby had gotten chicken box. So basically I said, but I've told you this before, gets everything, he's in crash because I work. And so he's in crash, catches everything. Now, but they're all like, this is normal. They all catch something. He'll have the immune system of an ox when he's older and all this. And yeah, so he got chicken box. <laughs> Actually, if we want to summarize, so since Christmas, he has had COVID, he has had handful and mouth, he has had just general colds and viral infections and stuff like that. Then he got chicken pox. Just as he was coming to the tail end of that, I got strep throat. And just as I was coming to the tail end of that, he got conjunctivitis. So be between all that, because obviously then I was trying to, he wasn't in crash, obviously he was at home with me. I was trying to then work from home. The place is like, was like a bomb, is like a bomb. I'm still... You know yourself. You know yourself. So yeah, I apologize. This video is gonna go out. Um, I've also got a video going up onto Patreon that I recorded. I'm in that little green top and I just haven't had time to edit it yet, but that will go up onto the Patreon. And then I have another, like I've loads of scripts written. It's just literally finding the time to record. It's it's funny because like I really enjoy this. I, I look like I love doing this. I'd love if this was like a full-time thing. The recording is like my least favorite part because 
the learning is what I like. I like learning about new cases or learning more about cases I already knew. And then I like telling you guys and hearing, you know, hearing back from you guys about like, oh yeah, you already knew about this case, what you thought about this case, or you didn't know about it and this or that, or oh, here's another similar case. I like all that. I like the to and the fro and the back and forth. Yeah, it's just this part that has to be done. <laughs> Big enough rant, I think. Let me know what you think about this case. Let me know what you think about... If you want, I can cover that Connor Downey kind of in more, but there's not, to be honest, there's not a lot out there from it. I remember looking it up before. Okay, I'm gonna go. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the sport. Thank you for all the sport. Thank you for all your support, the likes, the comments, the sharing. And um, yeah, because even when I... Ha it's nice to see even that when I'm not putting up videos, I'd be worrying and stuff. And then like you get like little comments and you're just like... Mm. So yeah. Thank you very much. Gurv Mila Magot. Thanks. We shall see you in the next video. Bye.